You're listening to the Diplomats Asia Geopolitics Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Putz, coming to you from Washington, D.C. And this is your co-host, Ankit Panda, also in Washington, D.C. How you doing, Ankit? Doing pretty well. Um, gearing up for a busy autumn of quite a bit of traveling coming up, uh, including to the Asia Pacific region. So uh, looking yeah. forward to that. But good to be back with you, Katie. Fantastic. Yes, it's good to be back. So today we're going to discuss a recent development in the Indian Ocean, which I think took a lot of us by surprise, sort of this conclusion uh, to clue our listeners in. Five years ago, after the International Court of Justice issued a non-binding opinion stating that the UK had an obligation to bring to an end its administration of the Chagos Islands, uh, London uh, recently announced that it would indeed hand over sovereignty of the islands to Mauritius. Now, Mauritius was a British colony up until 1968, and it had long been packaged together with the Chagos Islands, which are in, in physical sense quite distant from almost everything in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but, uh, you know, as the British colonial empire was eroding, the British had actually separated the islands out into uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory, which has the terrible acronym of BIAT. I don't know if anybody uses that, but it's terrible. Uh, in 1965, they did that. And so when Mauritius became independent, London kept control of the islands. Now, the Chagos Archipelago covers a group of seven atolls, uh, more than 60 islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The largest of its islands is known as Diego Garcia. And arguably, Diego Garcia is why we're talking about this latent bit of decolonization uh, on this podcast. So, Ankit, let's start with these islands and their sort of outsized geopolitical role. Why is Diego Garcia significant and, and why really did this uh, take so long to resolve? Yeah, sure, Katie. I think that was a that was a really great scene setter. So, you know, Diego Garcia is significant essentially for being the, the most significant operating node in the Indian Ocean uh, proper, so actually in the Indian Ocean itself. For really the United States, it is a joint U.S.-U.K. facility uh, pursuant to the U.K.'s uh, previous claim of sovereignty over the British Indian Ocean territories and the Chagos Islands. So this is an important base. Uh, it, it, it features... Um, airstrips capable of allowing the United States to operate all of its current fleet of heavy strategic bombers, which the U.S. regularly does from Diego Garcia. So in terms of allowing the United States to project military power in the Indo-Pacific uh, and, and in the Indian Ocean region specifically, Diego Garcia uh, is in many ways kind of the analog to the U.S. territory in the Pacific of Guam in terms of the military relevance. Uh, and so the geopolitical relevance really does kind of um, center on this particular piece of soil. Um, the other Chagos Islands have remained essentially uninhabited uh, since the Brits uh, evicted the Chagos people uh, in uh, in the 1960s. So the kind of balancing act here for the UK uh, was really about how to preserve access to this facility, which is uh, an important joint facility for the US and the UK, while sort of navigating the increasingly untenable international legal position that the UK was forced into after the judgments that you talked about. So that's kind of the quick and dirty uh, background here about uh, the relevance of Diego Garcia. Yeah. So um, what what do we know about the deal that the British announced? Uh, and of, of course, it is uh, subject to finalization of, of a treaty and legal documents. So it's not really a done deal, though the announcement is pretty significant. Uh, can you go through some of the, the aspects of this deal and sort of how, also how Diego Garcia sort of features in, in the overarching architecture? Yeah, sure. So the basic gist, I mean, it's a it's a pretty simple deal overall, right? The basic gist of it is that um, Mauritius um, gets sovereignty uh, over all of the Chagos Islands, including Diego Garcia. But this transfer of sovereignty does not mean that the U.S. and U.K. lose access to Diego Garcia because the, the Mauritians have agreed to lease it back to the U.K. under a 99-year lease, uh, which is practically speaking for the foreseeable future going to allow the U.S. and U.K. to continue uninhibited use of this facility. So in a way, it optimizes for that balancing act I just described. It also, I think, resolves the international legal implications for the U.K. of um, essentially coming into compliance, right? And this has been kind of the subject of, you know, we don't have to talk about this too much on this podcast, but the domestic debate in the U.K. has, I think, highlighted the level of um, discomfort that I think some have, right? So this was a decision made under a labor government. Uh, labor, mm -hmm. notionally, I think, does give more creed to things like international law and international legal requirements. So, so you know, the, the Starmer government, Keir Starmer, the current labor prime minister, was criticized quite a bit by conservatives uh, as having made this deal to compromise UK sovereignty, which 
quite literally speaking, this deal does because it is a sovereignty transfer over a piece of territory administered by the United Kingdom. Um, but it obviously is in many ways a lot more compliant with international law. And I think the reason this also bears importance is because uh, in the Indo-Pacific, where you do have um, sovereignty disputes, maritime entitlement disputes from the South China Sea to land-based territorial disputes, the UK has been promoting the sanctity of international law against other countries, right? And so if the UK had sort of allowed this issue to continue festering, um, as it might have after after uh, 2019 in particular, um, after the ICJ ruling, that would have, I think, raised an obvious tension for the United Kingdom's ability to credibly uh, pursue international law, right? And, you know, these kinds of double standards, I think, exist elsewhere. I think the most familiar one to many of our listeners on this podcast is probably uh, the U.S. approach to the law of the sea, right? Uh, the U.S. enforces the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea without having ratified it. We, The U.S. Navy essentially treats it as customary international law for uh, the way in which it thinks about uh, legal requirements. So that's that's the essential contour of the deal. But yeah, Katie, like you said, there's there's a lot of details that have to be hammered out. Um, notably, what this also will result in uh, is uh, for the Chagos people, uh, which is sort of the historical justice angle, uh, allowing them to return to the other 60-ish islands with the exception of Diego Garcia. So it's not really a perfect agreement for uh, some of the Chagos people. So I think there will still be some criticism of the Mauritius government in particular, for taking this deal without fully evicting the UK and the US. But in my view, I mean, this represents the most realistic resolution of this particular uh, particular sovereignty issue, right? It is, again, many of the wounds of the 20th century and decolonization continue to play out in Asia, despite, uh, you know, the fact that we often treat it like history. And I think this is the latest, the latest example of that uh, in, uh, in particular. Yeah, and it's and it's difficult to sort of navigate uh, in such a way that Everybody gets at least a little bit of what they want. Um, uh, I think we should maybe now turn to, you know, how was this announcement received by other interested parties? Uh, it was notable that both the U.S. and India almost instantly had mm -hmm. uh, announcements that they put out, sort of calling it a historic agreement and, and welcoming uh, this resolution. I thought the the Indian statement was uh, interesting. It it it, sta it said, this significant understanding completes the decolonization of Mauritius, which sort of highlights India's interests. Uh, the U.S. statement called it a historic agreement and, and highlighted that Diego Garcia would continue to be accessible by the United States. Uh, but I'm curious your sort of take on, on those, those two reactions, but also uh, what other reactions have we seen uh, by other interested parties? Yeah, so I think, you know, those two are really important. And that actually reminds me, I, I left out one important component of the deal based on what's known right now, which is that Mauritius has apparently made a commitment to the UK to not allow foreign arm, uh, this I'm quoting, foreign armed forces from accessing or establishing themselves on the outer islands of the Chagos Archipelago. So that's an important kind of geopolitical angle there, right? The elephant in the room here, obviously, is China, which has started to make inroads in the Indian Ocean region. And so this will essentially give an assurance to the UK and the US that um, at no point will Mauritius sort of use this sovereignty transfer to cut a deal with China. Although I have to say, I mean, big question mark on how this will be implemented in the treaty in a legally binding form, or this essentially might just be a political commitment. And I, and I think as we know, and as we've discussed repeatedly on this podcast, you know, domestic political changes in many of the smaller countries um, in the Indo-Pacific and the Indian Ocean region, as we've seen potentially uh, in the Maldives, for instance, uh, and Sri Lanka, uh, can result in a change of disposition towards China vis-a-vis -vis the UK and the US, for instance. Um, in general terms, I mean, you know, I think it's the usual suspects when it comes to international law. India is interesting because India has been involved in arbitration with Bangladesh for resolving the status of um, maritime claims along the India-Bangladesh frontier. And so, again, to remain consistent with that, I think the Indians would have to have a statement that essentially supported this kind of an arrangement. And the decolonization language, I think, relates to India's broader, longer-term interests in supporting um you know, decolonization, the non-aligned states, the global south, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, I mean, you know, you haven't really seen too much critique, I would say, from uh, countries like China, uh, who've largely, I think, um, refrained from making too big of an issue out of this. Because, again, um, I think what's interesting with, with, with China is obviously the Hong Kong president, right? The, the UK mm -hmm. transferred uh, sovereignty of Hong Kong back to China under uh, special administrative status in 1997. And so critiquing this would raise, I think, an uncomfortable double standard for the Chinese as well. Um, and so really, I think this is being seen as a 
and as an example of a you know a member of the p5 i don't know if you'd consider the uk a global power anymore but a member of the p5 at least making a good faith effort to comply with international law so in that sense i think this is again um to be welcomed um and i think um the other thing i would just flag here is i think this raises an interesting uh potential uh, opportunity for india as well which you know india sort of sees itself as the net security provider in the indian ocean region with a lot more um a lot more of a an ability particularly with naval forces to um respond quickly uh to sort of natural disasters crises which which india has done in recent years so i think with this sovereignty transfer we could additionally see india starting to play a more prominent role in engaging with mauritius and becoming more active uh, in the southern indian ocean region uh, even with this um, deal going through all right well unless you have any final thoughts on it i think we can wrap it up there um interesting sudden development in the the indian ocean which is obviously uh, very important to us here at the diplomat yeah, I think, um, you know, the only other thing that I uh, I would add here is um, the implementation of this, I think, will be will be interesting. And I think the the kind of treaty process will continue to receive a bit of scrutiny, at least uh, in the domestic politics uh, of the UK. The other thing, I mean, this is, you know, nowhere in the Indo-Pacific, but I just wanted to flag for listeners that might be interested. I mean, uh, there is sort of, I think, an interesting debate playing out in the UK about whether the acceptance of this sovereignty transfer might have implications for the UK's other overseas territory. I mean, most notably uh, the Falklands and Gibraltar. Mm. Um, I don't really know, but I think it's an interesting kind of thing to uh, just float here in terms of the longer term implications. Uh, But yeah, Katie, I think we can uh, leave it there today. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast. Uh, If you have not yet, please leave us a review. uh, And you are always welcome to write to Ankit or I with ideas for future episodes. We'll be back soon with more.